Hey everyone, welcome to week 21, day one. This is a whole new week, new theme. And we're gonna call this week the whole and the part. And what we're gonna try to do is first identify the whole of our picture, the bigger ideas that are behind our painting. And then we're gonna inch our way towards the part of our picture. And we're gonna try to strike a balance between whole and part so that our message is communicated strongly. So let's see how we do this week. It's a very abstract kind of theme. It's hard to get a grasp on what it actually means, but we're gonna work hard to try and see how it actually manifests itself in the painting. So let's see how we do. Okay, let's get started. Now for this week, we're gonna do something a little bit different that builds upon what we did last week. But it's not going to be a purely technical exercise because last week our starting point was something that is absolutely formal and objective. We thought about values and we thought about how the restriction of the value scale could in turn make us think about the way the images that we produce can be read, can be understood. And the idea behind that is that by having a heightened consciousness of how value has an effect over the manner in which a picture is being observed, we can then put to use all that power and all that information when we design a painting. So it's a variable that we take into account before we start to generate relationships within a painting. If we marry the message that we're trying to convey with the manner in which we express it, then our painting, it's gonna be at its most powerful. And the message that is trying to be expressed is going to be communicated at its loudest. I think that was the lesson from last week, that we have to be aware of all the makeup of our painting. It's not just about having intent, it's also having the ability to communicate that intent through formal decisions. Now, for this week, I thought it'd be interesting to touch upon something that I realized was very much so present in the making of the paintings that uh, we were doing last week. Now, last week, because there was a homogenizing exercise with the decision to make every value compressed into one, into a single value, the idea of being able to understand the wholeness of the picture was very, very present, was very, very evident to me while I was painting. And I thought about, well, we should dedicate a week to speak about this concept of wholeness, because it's something that I think we often hear about, particularly when we are in our formation, when we are in our foundation years, where our teachers are trying to express that we should be able to have a firm grasp on the bigger ideas that we want to communicate. And by bigger ideas, I mean, what is at the core of your message? And what we're trying to do, us teachers, and when I was a student, I also heard this message constantly, and it is one that I try to relate to my students. What we're trying to do when we say that is that you have to weed out everything that is not indispensable to your painting. Everything that is not absolutely necessary, you don't put it in your painting. That doesn't mean that your painting, that the images that you create have to be barren but it means that every single choice that turns into a painted decision has to be answering to a bigger idea. And this is something that is very, very tough. It's very tough to verbalize, it's very tough to communicate, but I think we as painters, and I remember when I was a young painter, it's a concept that it's especially hard to grasp. Thankfully for us, there is an exercise that we can do when working from life, you know, I've, I've gotten a lot of comments about the using of pictures in the uh, majority of the paintings that I'm doing right now, even though there are a bunch of paintings that we've worked from life, that there is a sense of kind of purity of working from life and that you're kind of sacrificing it if you are not. I love image making. I am an illustrator at heart. And I think as an illustrator, as somebody who loves to make pictures, 
the possibilities in my mind are boundless. I don't really feel restrained and I don't really feel beholden to any particular way of making a painting. I actually find there is a very enriching ground that I can learn from when working either from life or from whatever references I can gather. So this exercise, this particular thing that I'm speaking about, happens when we work from life. And this is how I was educated. Even though I'm saying that I'm an illustrator, my formation is actually quite formal, is actually quite classical in a way, because the majority of the classes that I chose were life drawing classes and life painting classes. So we painted from life for six hours, you know, Mondays and Fridays, and Thursdays we would paint from life also for three hours, I think. And I had maybe four or five classes of drawing from life, which were three hour classes. So the majority of time in my formation years, I was working from life. That is the way I learned how to interpret what I saw and translate it into paint. The one thing that is a constant every time you take a workshop or you go into a drawing class or a painting class is that your instructor maybe, she's telling you to squint. She's speaking about squinting as this incredibly simple and yet powerful act. And I was always quite hesitant about squinting. I've already talked about it, but because I am myopic, I actually need glasses if I were going to paint from life and if I'm at a distance from my model. Because if I don't wear my glasses, I'll just see a kind of blurry image. But I've never, ever, ever liked to wear glasses when I paint because like I've expressed it before, I always think there's like a surge of an excess of information that's just, you know, flowing into my brain, you know, through my eyes and into my brain. And I feel that the painting act, which I related as being something akin to like a strainer, where you put things through a strainer, the less things that I have to put in there, then the easier it is for something to come out. But if, if I just pile a ton of information into that strainer, then it's just going to make the act of synthesizing something a little more difficult. And that's why I, you know, I don't refuse and I understand when I have to put on my glasses, but I always try to prolong the moment where I can rely on my, you know, quote unquote, bad eyesight, because I am seeing less than the regular person that has a 2020 vision, let's say. It was super funny to me when people told me to squint because I just didn't really understand it. I thought it was just an act that obstructed my vision. But then my teachers explained to me that what you're trying to do is just eliminate all these secondary moments of information that are usually kind of asking for your attention. What we end up seeing when we squint it's just a bigger presence of that image in the sense that what we're seeing is a large mass of light and a large mass of shadow. So if you think about it, what we're eliminating, and let's say, for example, if we were to paint a portrait, we wouldn't really be looking at the superficiality of the skin. For example, we wouldn't be really looking at wrinkles or we wouldn't really be looking at eyelashes or maybe a tiny little highlight on the eye. No, what we would be aware of is how the light was flooding from up above through the face and how the forms were being described by the light that was flowing in that downward direction. So the idea was that we should be able to maintain a grasp on that bigger quality of light. You know, and there was a big emphasis on light being the one thing that we were painting because in essence it is. We've mentioned this before, but we are capable of observing forms in nature because of light. So it is a very beautiful idea that in the end, when we describe form, we're actually describing how the light is traveling through those forms. That's actually what we're painting if we are interested in that naturalist way of looking at light and form and its effect on form. But I remember eventually getting a grasp on what the idea of wholeness was, the idea of this bigness that could be translated into big masses of light and shadow. But I eventually wanted to see what would happen if I felt a desire to further develop my paintings. So yes, it was very, very important to be able to block in something 
with very broad marks that would take me to a big idea of what was in front of me. But, you know, at some point, I was also interested in seeing if I was able to depict the particular qualities of a nose, let's say, or a mouth, or if I could model an eye. And I was curious what would happen if I would go towards the part, if I would work towards the part. So what eventually happens is that you get somewhat prolific at doing block-ins, at doing this generalized depiction of what you're looking at, but then you have to make a transition to try to speak about the particular qualities of, you know, whatever is in front of you. And what happened to me, and I don't know if this has happened to you guys, is that when I wanted to make that transition, instead of it just being very organic and very slow because the pace of it has to be very measured, what I would do is I would do a block in and then just really quickly, almost prematurely jump into wanting to depict details, to describe very, very fine details. So I wouldn't just really model form. I would go block in detail, block in detail. And that was the way I painted, you know, many, many paintings. And it always felt off. It always felt that the idea of wholeness was disjointed from the idea of the part. And I never realized why that was happening. And eventually, and this was kind of cool when I actually saw other painters develop paintings, particularly some of my teachers develop their paintings, I realized that my pacing was off. My pacing was absolutely off. Because, for example, whenever I saw Max paint, you know, it was a very kind of slow burn. The pacing of his paintings is just, and has always been, very, very slow, but it doesn't mean that he takes a long time to model form. And it would come as a surprise to me, but he knew exactly what he was doing. He was taking very slow steps, very, very particular, but very specific steps towards something. And he knew that every single one of those steps was absolutely essential in the construction of whatever he was painting, let's say an eye. To me, it was surprising because I was like, what? how did that happen? You know, half an hour ago, that was just an eye socket. And now there's a highlight, you know, on the eye. Like, I didn't even notice when that happened. And I realized that it was a matter of pacing and a matter of understanding how to move forward. The tough part about all of this is that I don't know if that's easily taught. Because nobody really taught me how to do this. Nobody sat down and said, no, this is what you're missing. This is what you have to do. Like I later recognized that it, I was so eager to get to very particular information that I just wanted to jump ahead. But I was not conscious of what I was missing. I was absolutely unaware of the things that I had to do. So the answer, even though it would pain me to hear it, was always just go slower go slower. And I never quite understood that because I thought that what they were saying was that I was an impatient painter. And I felt a little bit defensive because I thought, well, I'm just trying to react and I'm trying to be expressive. So I don't know if there's anything wrong about that. I don't know if there's anything wrong of me just wanting to get to those things very, very quickly. And I guess they weren't really commenting on that aspect of my painting, on me wanting to be expressive. Nowadays, I understand that that has nothing to do with it. In them telling me to try and be patient, they were just trying to see if I could find that transitional moment of my painting where I could go from the big idea and to travel through that transition so that I could slowly get to the part. To be honest, I don't think I really quite understood that until years later. I think that that is one of the aspects that is the most difficult in painting. I sometimes think that the difference between, you know, masters that are regarded as being some of the biggest painters in art history and other artists that obviously had ability is the fact that these masters were able to hold on to bigger ideas for a longer time and the smaller parts of the painting were all working towards the clarity in the communication of that bigger idea. 
So yes, you could interpret them as details, but they were always details that were there just to be part of the whole, just to make the bigger idea, the idea of wholeness more powerful. A detail in itself would mean nothing. And I think that the difference was that the other painters, the other painters that clearly had ability, were not able to hold on to those bigger ideas. They were not able to understand that the smaller choices that they made had to be in service of those bigger ideas. So this is what we're going to try to do this week, which again, it kind of sounds very abstract, but it's trying to understand the bigger idea that we want to communicate and then trying to see if we can slowly approach the particular qualities of what we're trying to paint and how by slowly approaching them, we have to be mindful that every decision that we make in trying to approach the part cannot deviate us from the idea of the whole. Every time we take a wrong turn, that's when we get frustrated. That's when we have to backpedal. That's when we have to scrape paint away. That's when we have to tell ourselves, no, we should wait for uh, tomorrow, that it's a new session, and we should be able to correct this. The idea is that progression in painting can be something very organic that feels like you're slowly moving forward. But the important thing is that we are moving forward. Now, and here's the tough part. It doesn't mean that we have to have this sense of clarity when we paint because we don't. We don't. Sometimes it's fine if we understand that there's a presence of doubt when we paint. That is absolutely fine and we have to be comfortable with that. And many times that sense of doubt means that we are going to be working on a painting and we are going to be feeling like we're moving forward and then backward and then forward and then backward, or that we have to revisit the painting and we have to adjust many decisions that we had previously made. That's totally fine. You know, I'm not saying that uh, just by having this mentality of slowly moving forward, then a painting is just going to be flawlessly constructed and you're not going to feel any sense of pain or remorse with any of the decisions that you make. No, we have to be realistic. What we're hoping is that we can inch our way towards that very, very kind of flowy sense of painting where even though we are battling with doubt constantly, we can be conscious of the fact that maybe we don't know exactly what we're doing, but while we're painting, we are trying to figure out. We're so aware of every decision that we're making in our painting that we're slowly, slowly trying to figure it out. And that's going to be the focus of this week. Again, I know it sounds a little tough and I know it sounds a little bit abstract, but Trust me, it's one of the toughest, toughest things to do in painting. Just Even just identifying what the wholeness of your painting means is something that's very tough because in essence, what that usually is referring to is that you are identifying why you're painting whatever you're painting. And that's tough in and of itself. I mean, that's a question that you, <laughs> we all have to answer throughout our lives. So this doesn't mean that we can't start to approach the idea of dissecting the whole so we can get to paint the parts if we haven't understood what our bigger ideas are. No, we could do all this growing at the same time. But this exercise during this week of just holding back, of mentally squinting, you know, squinting so that we can see the bigger relationships in our painting, so that we can hold on to those for as long as we can, and then we slowly, slowly try to get closer to those particulars of the painting that are of our interest is something that's very, very helpful. And the coolest thing about this, and I've found that this is a very kind of simple way to understand you know, us as painters, us as individual painters, is that when we start making that transition from the whole to the part, Every single person out there, every single artist out there is not going to choose the same part. You know, what's very cool and interesting about this is that we're all going to gravitate towards something that's different about 
the qualities that we see in the whole. So by slowly trying to identify which part it is that is grabbing our attention, that is moving us, we are also understanding our perception. We are also understanding why we're connecting with the particular qualities of whatever we're looking at. So in being patient and very slowly moving forward, we are identifying ourselves as painters. We are identifying the way in which our vision is shaped. And that is super, super important. So essentially for this week, we're going to try to do a block in and hold on to those bigger ideas, you know, as long as we can. And then when we just can't hold on to those any longer because we, we just understand that they're all there, then we're going to slowly, slowly move forward. And hopefully we can stop in different moments of the painting. And that's what I'm going to try to do during this week. I'm going to show you different moments that I kind of stop in a painting because I've reached a balanced relationship between the part and the whole. Sometimes that means that there's not going to be a lot of detail like today because I wanted these noodles to feel really, really wholesome because that's what they communicate to me. And other times during the week, I'll try to move you know, forward and see what happens when I go for smaller detail and see if I could maintain that balance. I think it's going to be a super cool week. So let's see if we can put all of the formal qualities that we've worked on and put them into use by identifying the bigger qualities of the things that move us and see if we could translate those into painted decisions. And when we try to move forward, we're not going to run this week. We're going to inch towards the finish line. Okay, so that's going to be it for today. Thank you guys for hanging out. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.